Here's the outline for the talk today, kind of four elements to this. One is I, I want to start by thinking, uh, by considering some um, problems that environmentalists working in North America have um, identified in terms of how environmentalism as a social and political movement has been, has been pursued. And uh, this turns, uh, to, uh, turns around the question of, um, of a kind of a basic paradigm or a worldview for how uh, we human beings uh, imagine our place uh, in the world and our relationship to it. And what I want to make an argument for uh, in the presentation today is really that there's something deeply important and valuable about the Taoist tradition in China uh, that can uh, help uh, eliminate or solve some of these problems that environmentalists in the West have come to think about uh, in terms of their own um, tradition of environmentalism. So I want to kind of turn this uh, certain kind of environmentalist paradigm on its head and then to think about, uh, so that's a kind of a little bit of philo philosophical kind of opening, then to think about this in, in terms of um, ethical relations between human beings and the natural world and the, and the possible contribution of uh, Taoism as a cultural tradition to China's attempt to construct uh, an ecological uh, civilization. Uh, um, so this is uh, basically the outline of the talk. In a way, uh, what I'm doing is slightly insane uh, <laughs> because uh, it's really uh, an outline for the um, book that I'm writing uh, at the moment. So if you imagine I have about 40 slides, which I will go through at about one a minute, and just imagine that these are about five pages each. And, uh, and this is a kind of overview uh, of a kind of uh, large thing that I'm that I'm trying to um, uh, that I'm trying to do t today. So in uh, my uh, adopted country, Canada, David Suzuki um, said, "Environmentalism has failed. Over the past 50 years, environmentalists have succeeded in raising awareness, changing logging practices, stopping mega dams and offshore drilling, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But we were so focused on battling opponents and seeking public support." that we failed to realize these battles reflect fundamentally different ways of seeing our place in the world. And it's our deep underlying worldview that determines the way that we treat our surroundings. And so uh, this, uh, this um, criticism, uh, or it, this uh, points out a kind of um, uh, a failure in the way that environmentalism has been prosecuted in terms of, we l in terms of focusing on uh, stopping certain things from happening or attending to small-scale uh, issues. But what's really at the heart of this, um, you know, in uh, David Suzuki's uh, mind, is uh, a kind of a deeper battle, uh, um, hesitate to say hearts and minds, but um, a kind of a deeper battle for, th for uh, a, a much deeper kind of structural change in how people engage the world and imagine the world um, around them. And then uh, in, uh, in the US as well, uh, Gus Speth, who until recently was the Dean of the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies at Yale, um, <laughs> called it for what he calls a kind of new environmental discourse, uh, requiring efforts at grassroots organizing, strengthening groups, blah, 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 writing a new American story, or if you're Xi Jinping, a new Chinese dream, uh, as uh, Bill Moyers has urged. Our environmental discourse has been dominated by lawyers, scientists, and economists, now we need to hear a lot more from poets, preachers, philosophers, and psychopaths. No, psychologists, sorry. Uh, um, <laughs> I always get that one wrong. I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there's a reason for that, but we won't go into that one uh, right now. <laughs> so uh, here, this is about a kind of a discourse, right? So, I mean, you know, we're used to environmental language being... Uh, of course, it has to be uh, grounded in science and, of course, the main work uh, in terms of understanding the scale of environmental problems that we face with is, of course, something that is quantifiable and measurable in terms of science. But there's a kind of a discourse failure in translating this into something that resonates with the uh, people, with, uh, with, the, um, you know, with the ordinary people. And this, I think, is, uh, again, call, this is not so much a calling for a kind of revolution in the same way that David Suzuki is, but at least a shift in a shift in a shift in discourse. One of the things that's underlying all of this is, I think, our a kind of um, worldview of uh, modernity. And I think there are two things going on here. And th what I rely on for this is a book by um, Bronislav Shashinsky called Nature, Technology and the Sacred. And what he argued in this book was that 
the transition towards uh, to uh, modernity in the West entailed the construction of nature as a singular unified reality that could be objectively uh, grasped uh, and uh, cognized scientifically and theorized and so forth. This is one realm. And at the same time, the construction of our modern understanding of religion uh, as, a, uh, as, a, um, a, a, as a functioning in some kind of transcendent uh, uh, realm. And he talks th about this in terms of what he calls the long arc of monotheism in the West and the gradual overcoming of uh, pagan ideas in which um, nature and spirits and uh, religion were kind of intermingled in a kind of social in a kind of a human society the separation of these two realms the construction the pushing off of religion into this uh, into this uh, totally transcendent uh, world and at the same time the construction of nature and the basic argument and then he goes his whole thing about technology as well the basic argument of his book is that we can't understand how we, how we came to our modern understanding of nature without also, at the same time, understanding how we arrived at our modern understanding of religion. That these two things are part and parcel of the same, I uh, the same um, uh, ideological transformation uh, in, uh, in, uh, in modernity. And we have come to uh, live in this world and to regard these a kind of separation of these two worlds as a natural result of historical progress so that we consider this separation of the religious world and the natural world as being inevitable modern um, progress upon what what was uh, what has gone before and what this leads to of course in the religious sphere is the denigration or deprecation of forms of religion that are uh, embedded in nature that these are regarded as pagan religions becomes a pejorative term we see this in uh, in uh, colonial understandings of indigenous traditions and we see this in the construction of a kind of magic and witchcraft as discourses of false religion where somehow this religious world is commingled with this world of this world of nature, those are all regarded pejoratively and uh, uh, by uh, um, in this in this modern uh, worldview, and it seems natural to us to to imagine this to be the case. Nature, when understood objectively, is something outside of us, right? It becomes an environment, something that is disconnected from our subjectivity. It's something that we can see objectively, we can th analyze scientifically. Uh, we can transform it technologically and we can make it productive with our uh, economy, right? So this is what happens when nature becomes regarded as this. And this is the foundation of industrial uh, civilization and all of the, I'm not saying this is a bad thing. I'm just saying this is all of the things that are, you know, part of all of the things that, has, uh, that have happened. We have this totally transcendent religious world. This is a, an assumption of the Virgin Mary by um, Botticini. So uh, uh, um, this, uh, the heavenly world and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the earthly world are kind of s separated. And, this, and in Bran Krzyzynski's book, this uh, kind of long arc culminates in a kind of deism, I suppose, where we have this, uh, this idea of God who, is, uh, t uh, who simply <coughs> sets the laws of nature in motion and no longer intervenes in the world or does miracles or, uh, or, or who acts in the world in any kind of concrete, uh, concrete, uh, concrete way. And in this uh, kind of contemporary period, we have this construction of a purely subjective spirituality, a spirituality of life embedded in, in, in individual subjectivity. Uh, this uh, the latest book from Paul Helas in, um, in the UK, Spiritualities of Life. And he talks about this new kind of spiritual but not religious movement uh, as something that is bound up in this uh, subjective turn that happens in late that happens in late modernity, spirituality becomes identified with life itself, the agency which sustains life, spirituality to be found within the depths of sub subjective life, our most valuable experiences of what it means to be alive. So we have the natural world all over there. there. We have this religious transcendent world all up here, and we have this interior subjective. Uh, 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 spiritual sp uh, sense of uh, spirituality, and these are all part and part and parcel of, I think, this uh, idea of subjectivity that we that uh, seems so inevitably natural to us. But what I think uh, cultural historians, uh, of course, uh, would argue is something that has happened uh, to to us. 
So we think that subjectivity relies in ourselves as individual rational human agents. We exercise this free agency upon the natural world conceived of as the environment, this thing around us that is separate from us. And we have consciousness and spirituality within our own subjectivity. And the natural world is material, inert, something to be transformed by our own, uh, by our own sense. So we have this picture then of our environmental footprint. You know, this is us acting upon the world. And this becomes the kind of basic paradigm that environmentalism inherits. And, and so environmentalists start to think about how do then do we reduce our, uh, you know, um, I, need, I need some big boots, you know, to do this, uh, right? Uh, how, how, do we, how do we, you know, reduce this uh, stamping out of, uh, 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 um, upon the world? So we've lived through an age of grand divergence of spirituality and consciousness on the one hand and nature and environment on the other hand. And this has enabled us to imagine a life for ourselves that is not ineluctably implicated in the ecological processes that give us life in the first place. I'm sorry for that really terrible sentence. I'm, I, I, um, please send me your corrections uh, um, later on. Um, uh, you know, we see this in, uh, if you've read any kind of um, post-human, uh, post-humanist writings and this idea that uh, the kind of analogy here is that our essential personality is really a kind of like a software, you know, right? And we can, we can divorce this uh, kind of software thing from the hardware of our, um, of, our, uh, of our bodies and we can download our consciousness to the, to the great, uh, to, to the great uh, Steve Jobs in the sky. And, uh, and, uh, and, and somehow this will somehow be able to preserve our, what is essential about our own, uh, about our own um, um, subjectivity and enables us to imagine freedom as the freedom of the self from the constraints of nature, from the constraints of bio biology. And I'm not, uh, I don't want to, uh, you know, here to put a kind of a deep value judgment on it, but this is, uh, but, but to say that these are the kinds of cultural, intellectual processes that have enabled the, uh, that, the and that frame the parameters of how environmentalism as a social movement uh, has, uh, has, beg has begun. And, um, and uh, uh, I, uh, I want today to completely flip <coughs> this whole paradigm on its head and to imagine what is it like if we think about nature not as an environment that happens outside of us, but as like, a, what's the opposite of an environment? An in, in, in environment, an in... I know I'm struggling with this word. I, 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 I sometimes I, I talk about an, an insistence, right? And nature as an insistence, something that comes to live in us and not the other way around, right? And, and this insight, um, this, this, way of, uh, this way of thinking, uh, I, uh, you know, I've kind of inherited from this studying these um, Taoist traditions. Anyway, just to go back one step, this modern con conception of environmentalism is that somehow it becomes our responsibility to take care of this uh, little green planet thing, right? I mean, this is an insane idea in a way, right? I mean, and we, when, when I Googled environmental responsibility for images, you know, it came up with this, came up with this thing, you know, here we have this little earth thing here. And, uh, and uh, somehow it's our responsibility to, to look after this. Uh, and and uh, what I'm saying, these things that perhaps we take for granted or that environmentalists take for granted have a v are the product of a kind of deep history of cultural imagination that have things to do with Christianity and to do the Enlightenment uh, ideas such that we get this picture, uh, such that we get this, uh, this, uh, this picture here. What I want to do today is to say, just at least the first part is to kind of conduct a little thought experiment. What is it like to imagine this the other way around? And to imagine the environment not as something outside of us, but something inside of us. <coughs> so this image here is from a Taoist uh, text, and it's the image of, uh, it's a representation of the human body as a mountain. And it's, the mountain has a water flowing through it, it has a little pagoda here, and, uh, and it has these uh, various uh, labels talking about different points of the points within the points within the human body, but um, but and this belongs to a tradition of visualization in Taoist religion, where 
the, 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 the functioning of the body, the chi flowing in the body, all of these things that are going on, are imagined, are imaged in terms of the natural landscape. That is, the landscape is some, it becomes something, a tool, you know, for imaging what is, what is going on in the body. And the people who were doing these uh, kinds of meditation, of course, weren't at all concerned with nature or the environment or anything like this. And I don't want to, I don't want to suggest uh, that, they, that, they, that they were or that Taoism has anything uh, intrinsically to do with uh, environmentalism in any, in any modern sense. I'm just using, the, I'm just trying to, I'm showing this picture because it triggered for me this uh, kind of imaginative um, uh, flip. Uh, what, what, what is it like to imagine uh, nature inside, uh, nature inside uh, oneself? Another, this is probably the most famous of these uh, kind of images. This is from the Baiyungguan, uh, the White Cloud <coughs> Temple in Beijing. It's a big stone stele, an image of the, uh, image of the body um, uh, um, uh, as this uh, kind of world of uh, stars and animals and plants and uh, trees. And it's, a medita and it's a meditation map, if you like. So Taoists were concerned to understand the way in which qi flows within the body and to direct and manipulate uh, this uh, qi. And so they developed these uh, kinds of maps to try and describe and think about and trying to explain these uh, kind of internal processes happening inside, inside the body. There's a close-up of one of these uh, bits uh, here. Uh, so um, so, I, so I, for me, this is a kind of richly imaginative way of, uh, and, and a kind of very striking and powerful, uh, evocative image of thinking about our th thinking about our bodies. Then, in this, um, uh, here's a, this is a Taoist, uh, um, a Taoist text describing the gestation of a fetus. Uh, when a father and mother unite in harmony, humans receive life. The first month, essence and blood coagulate in the womb. In the second month, the embryo begins to take shape. In the third month, yang spirit arouses your three yang souls to come to life. In the fourth, money, fourth month, the yin energy settles the seven yin souls as guardians of the body. In the fifth month, the five elements of the cosmos are distributed to the five organs to keep the spirits at peace. Six cosmic sounds set up in six intestines. The seven stars of the Big Dipper shine upon or through the bodily orifices, letting light in from the stars. Eight heavenly lights descend with their vital energy and blah, blah, blah. So what is happening as a fetus is gestating, it is being infused with the cosmos, right? The cos so your existence, uh, your existence is not an existence, <laughs> right? It's an infusion. So and, uh, what I mean by this is we commonly think of ourselves as existing, having a subjectivity that is functions upon this inert background, right? This world that we live in, and this world that we live in is simply the background upon which we act uh, with our own individuality and we are in subjectivity. And we imagine ourselves as being unique individuals whose existence, whose individuality is constituted precisely by our difference from the world around us, right? So we're constituted by difference from the world around us. And in this, um, uh, in, this, uh, in this Taoist text, the opposite idea is presented that our individuality, that our existence, that our subjectivity is constituted by the infusion of the cosmos into our, into our life. So we are who we are by infusion, by, or in other words, uh, the other word I sometimes use is insistence. You know, we don't have existence, we have insistence. So we don't, this, this nature thing, this cosmos infuses, infuses us with life and our existence is the product of this uh, infusing, this indwelling of uh, cosmic uh, vitality and power and life in us. So the environment takes place inside your body. The, your body does not take place inside the environment, right? This is the flipping of this uh, paradigm, right? So normally we <coughs> think about ourselves having a body which wanders around and takes place in this grand space around us. And what I want to say is, no, it's the space around us that takes place inside us, and not the other, and not the, and not the, uh, not the other way around. One of the things that this, this that uh, enab that happens then in the um, in this. Uh, uh, when we th when we think about uh, when we think about the relationship between our bodies and the space around us in this way, 
is that it enables us to think about our bodies not only, sorry, it enables us not only to think about our bodies as an infusion of the landscape or the environment around us, but at the same time to imagine the natural world, the environment, as a body, right? So it's a, this is a, becomes a two-way process. How is this possible? Because the natural world and the life of the human body are both the functioning of qi, right? So qi is usually written about by philosophers and so forth. <coughs> I'm sorry if there are any philosophers in this room. I don't mean to disparage all philosophers. Um, uh, uh, you know, one of the words that the philosophical words that uh, term the ways that this is understood is as vital energy uh, that produces an idea of continuity of being. That is to say that that our being is of our of our us ourselves as human beings is continuous in some way with the world around us. There's some kind of continuity, some shared, uh, shared vitality between us and the world around us. So I, I want to suggest a different kind of metaphor here, which is to understand qi as liquid process, right? So qi is a kind of, it functions like a liquid. That is to say it is, um, I'm sorry, well my physics is, uh, is, uh, is, 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 fa is failing me now, right? Um, I had all this written out somewhere. So it, anyway, it, 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 it has a, dyna it has a, it flows, right? Uh, right, it has a, it has a, it's not, it's not a static thing. It's something that, it's a fluid, thank you very much. Uh, fluid dynamics. Oh my God, when did I take fluid dynamics? I never, no, no, I never took fluid dynamics. <laughs> Maybe some of you took <laughs> fluid dynamics. Anyway, so it's, it's a fluid dynamic chi, right? And, we, and, this is, and this functions in our body, giving us life. And at the same time, it functions in the natural, in the natural world. Uh, the natural world is also a liquid process, right? Just like the human body is a liquid, uh, a liquid process. And when we imagine the natural world as bodies, we can imagine uh, this, this uh, transference of imagery also happens the other way. So in the Taoist tradition, caves are very important as places of meditation. And just as the, though we might imagine the organs of the body as these uh, kind of cave spaces in the mountain of our body, in which, uh, in which uh, qi percolates and flows and, 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 uh, and coagulates and all of these kinds of things, so also it's possible to imagine the caves in mountains, places of meditation for Taoists, as, um, as uh, the kind of natural organs, you know, the bodily organs uh, of the mountain. And this quote from uh, Thomas uh, Hahn here, he said, the caves, despite a singular solidity, uh, their physical permeability in terms of air and water flow reflects the inner workings of the human body. Blood equals water, air equals breath, Spermatic liquids form pools. Walls constitute shapes like inner organs or, um, or viscera. Mountains have an interiority to them, uh, like, the, like the human body. Um, oh, sh oh, shit, I didn't mean to show this slide. Okay, can we just scratch that from the uh, video? Tape? No, right. So, <laughs> so uh, there's a whole, um, uh, a whole um, a kind of other way of thinking about the, the, the nature. Since we've got the slide here, I'll, uh, I'm going to talk about it, which is to think about what we fundamentally do is ingesting this natural world, right? Well, this is this, the fundamental dynamic or relationship between our bodies and the natural world is one of, in, is one of ingestion, right? So we're taking, the, and with the easiest way to think about this is, of course, breathing. You know, we simply breathe in this uh, stuff from outside us and it come, percolates through our bodies and we absorb things through our, uh, the, our skin, you know, which we imagine to be, in fact, a kind of barrier between the world outside and the interior world of our bodies, but really they're a kind of, it's a kind of permeable <coughs> membrane, you know, through which we are absorbing all of this stuff from the world outside and also expelling it from our own bodies. Um, um, but um, the, um, uh, but um, part of this uh, kind of imagination of nature that became, that has become very important in the Chinese imagination is the idea that not all nature is equal, right? And that there are special things, special places, special foods uh, that, that, can, that you can ingest that will have special properties uh, for your body. And this is very important in Chinese medicine uh, so, that, um, uh, so that you eat certain kinds of uh, foods that have special properties for your bodies. It's important in Chinese uh, cookery as, um, you know, as everybody 
um, as everybody knows. And it's also one of the things that has, uh, that has become, um, that has become uh, an important issue at the moment, which is the, relev the role of Chinese culture in terms of, the, the, in terms of acquiring exotic uh, 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 animals and extinguishing, uh, you know, and um, causing animals to become um, extinct. Anyway, um, uh, this I just so I just wanted to, this is a little story. Uh, this is a, a fragment, a, a very fragmentary hagiography of a Taoist immortal. Um, uh, Zheng Siyuan was Ge Hong's teacher. Once among the mountain cliffs, he obtained two tiger babies. Their mother had died. The Lord fed them until they were full grown. Shortly, a male tiger came to the front of the hermitage. It was the two tigers' father. The three tigers came to and fro and followed him around. First part of the story. Later, he carried his medical herbs on his back, lifted his, his scriptures and books up, retired to the mountain, and left the world as an immortal. It's a kind of quirky little story that uh, there are many of these um, biographies of Taoist saints um, are like this. And at first, when I thought about it, I th you know, when I first thought about this, I thought, um, well, here it's uh, it's one of those quirky stories, right? Some here's some Taoist guy, and he randomly meets some <coughs> tigers, and then some strange thing happens, and then he becomes an immortal. And isn't life weird, right? That's a kind of uh, uh, one way to think about this. Um, at the um, at the same time, um, I think that what it uh, shows is that there's a, there's some kind of connection, you know, between this uh, this person's. Um, uh, meeting these uh, tigers and then eventually somehow becoming an immortal being. And the, the, the connection is not at all made explicit. It's simply in this story, he meets these tigers and looks after them. And then later on in his life, he becomes an immortal. But the story invites us to assume some kind of connection between, uh, between these two stories. And, um, and, uh, you, and uh, we can read this if we want. We can interpret this once with a kind of environmentally friendly message. You know, he looked after the little tigers, and isn't that nice? And then he kind of received this reward by ascending into the, ascending into the heavens or as, um, as an immortal. But, uh, I, but uh, what I want to... I think there's... there's, there's uh, uh, I'm trying to point out a kind of an element, let's say, of this... Um, um, Taoist imagination of nature, which seems to favor these uh, kinds of exotic and rare places. And I'm flagging this uh, for because I'm not trying to, s because I think this is also uh, responsible for a, a kind of a negative thing in terms of uh, China's dealing with exotic um, species and, and, and endangered animals. I'm not trying to paint a picture of Taoism as a totally positive kind of, uh, positive kind of thing, but there are these other things going on. You know, I went to Lo Guantai a few years ago. This is where Lao Tzu is supposed to have recited the Tao Te Ching. And there's a big Taoist temple there, and it's, it's near, it's uh, not so far from Xi'an, right, in the, in, you know, in the west of China. And he's supposed to have recited the Tao Te Ching there, and then gone off into the, you know, into the far west and disappeared from... Like, next, to this monast next to this temple at Lo Guantai, when I went to visit about five years ago, there was a zoo of exotic <coughs> animals. And I thought, well, what the hell's that doing there? Right? What, like, this is weird, right? And, and, then, and then, it, then it came to me that maybe, you know, this, this is um, this a kind of special place, this special religious uh, sacred place. Uh, there's some kind of affinity between that. Or it made sense within this uh, kind of cultural imagination to also have these rare and exotic animals in the same, you know, in the s being looked after in the, same, uh, in, uh, in the same place. And that there's some kind of cultural connection between this idea of, let's put it in a, give it a positive spin, between this idea of let us um, look after these uh, creatures and let us um, uh, uh, and, um, and, uh, make sure that these species don't become uh, endangered and all of that kind of thing on the one hand and also this uh, kind of um, this uh, religious uh, spiritual story on uh, on the other hand anyway there's something uh, there's something going on there so I didn't mean to talk about that at all but too late so a kind of constructing a kind of ethical framework f with some principles uh, <coughs> James Miller's 95 theses nailed to the wall here nature is not an environment outside of the body Landscape itself is a living, breathing body. The environment is not to be preserved or saved by humans. Qi is a liquid process 
of the landscape and the bodies, and underwriting all of this is this idea of Tao, or the way, the wellspring of life for all forms of creativity uh, in the world. And what I'm trying to do here is to start this uh, process of outlining a kind of um, Taoist environmental ethics, I suppose, let's, let, um, let, let, let's call it like that. And what we can do then is to imagine some of the problems of China from this other kind of perspective. And what I want to say is, instead of thinking about environmental problems in China, we can, uh, we can kind of frame these from the perspective of uh, Chinese traditions as a kind of qi problem, right? So, what does so China has a qi problem, right? And, uh, and one of these qi problems is that is well known is, of course, the drying up of China's rivers uh, and uh, the pollution <coughs> of the rivers, right? So, we can think about this. This is a kind of problem of uh, qi uh, that is happening in China and that this, we can frame this understanding of this environmental problem if we imagine China as a kind of a body that is a suffering uh, and, it's, and the suffering can be diagnosed and remedied uh, by thinking about it as a kind of, uh, as a kind of, uh, like a kind of Chinese, Chinese medicine framework, right? So the, uh, the, the, the landscape of China is, uh, has this uh, qi uh, um, deficiency. And of course, the other well-known problem is uh, that of um, smog and its uh, air pollution and its impact upon human, uh, human health. Last year was uh, one of the significant news stories uh, <coughs> about China environment. Last year was the Chinese government uh, formally admitting for the first time the existence of these cancer villages, places that are so toxic um, that uh, large amounts of uh, large rates of uh, high, much higher than normal rates of cancer are found amongst people here. What interested me about this story was that this, this epithet, cancer, which we normally think about something that happens in, in our bodies, had had, it had uh, crossed over the line and began to be applied not just to human bodies, but to, but to, the, but to the, the, land, the land itself and, and, the water, uh, and the water itself. Here's an example of a Western biomedicine metaphor crossing over into, crossing over from the from the from the you know human body biomedicine into the uh, into the into the land itself, so that uh, villages uh, the land itself could be Im could be described as being uh, uh, um, uh, as being uh, as being can uh, c cancerous, but also cancered as well. I think you're right. So um, uh, so um, so these are what I'm trying to do here is to think about environmental problems and human health as the same thing at, from the perspective of a kind of Chinese medicine understanding of qi flowing, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of qi flowing in the body. That, and that, these, uh, and that uh, what we don't have to do then is to constantly make this argument about whether or not these things is causing, uh, are causing problems in this case for people's for people's health here, which is a kind of enormously difficult thing to do, um, uh, you know, um, medically. Um, uh, um, but to imagine this life of China uh, as uh, 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 and the life of its people together as something that is a kind of suffering a deficiency or problems of, uh, of qi. What I'm trying to do is to kind of create a language, a new discourse a kind of a new metaphors from old, you know, from deep, you know, from deep, deep-seated uh, Chinese uh, from Chinese tradition, to try and uh, uh, to try and image this uh, fundamental relationships between human beings and the um, and, and the natural world. If we look in the Taoist tradition, uh, in the book Taoism and Ecology, published in two thousand and one. Christopher Schipper had an essay studying these 180 precepts of the early Taoist uh, community. And in amongst these 180 precepts were 20 <coughs> or 30 that we would now retrospectively call environmental precepts or environmental ethics. Things like not wantonly felling trees, not drying up well m wet marshes, don't fish or hunt, don't dig up uh, in hibernating animals and insects in winter, these kinds of, um, uh, these kinds of things. And in the essay, what he goes on to say is, why, right? Why is it that you should not do these things? 
And the conclusion that he comes to is that the, the force of this, you should not. I, it's not that, you know, God from on high has said, uh, if you do all of these things, you will be committing sin and we will, uh, you know, we will execute you or terrible, th or we will lock you up or put you in prison. It's that you shouldn't do these things because if you do them, you also will feel some, uh, will feel some ill effects uh, within yourself or within your community. That there is a principle of reciprocity between the life of the human community and the individuals and the life of the world around. There's a principle of reciprocity or eco-relationality, if we want to give it a, a kind of a new, uh, a new kind of word. And that this is this um, <laughs> kind of default moral imagination in this religious uh, in this religious community so this is an idea of about of of uh, I it's a way of thinking about morality not in terms of legal prescriptions not in terms of uh, not in terms of legal prescriptions or not in terms of divine command but in terms of this built-in reciprocity between the world and the uh, and the lives of our bodies and the um, and the and the community uh, who cares so uh, the reason we care is uh, we know that uh, you know China is in the midst of uh, or of trying to construct a way of life that um, a way of development that will not lead it into all of the same problems of development of industrialization that we have had um, in the West and of course the big problem in China is how do we develop the economy without totally undermining the ecological systems and processes that enable us to have life in the first place. That's one kind of central problem that China is uh, grappling with at the moment. Another central problem is as we become a modern nation, what is the place of our traditions in the modernity? Right? Do we obliterate them completely? Do we become Confucian fundamentalists? Uh, I'm not sure if we have Confucian fundamentalists yet, but we probably will soon. Um, what is the position? What is the proper place for all of our traditions in the in the um, in in the present in the present day? And uh, and uh, and uh, you know and um, uh, uh, Panuet, the vice minister of Env environmental protection, wrote a famous essay. Um, calling for the development of uh, uh, environmental culture and a national renaissance, forging traditional Chinese views of nature with a kind of rather nationalistic idea, that is to say, uh, we want a kind of development that is properly Chinese, that takes into account Chinese, uh, that takes <coughs> into account uh, Chinese traditions and avoid these uh, kind of destructive excesses of Western styles of moderni modernization. So there is a kind of one thing that is happening in China at the moment is the constructing of a kind of ecological discourse that's also a kind of nationalistic uh, discourse as well. And uh, I have an article called Green is the New Red or Red is the New Green. I can't remember which way around it is. Anyway, that kind of that, that, um, that, that, um, that, 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 um, talks that, um, that talks about this. The reason I'm saying this is that there is a space in the public imagination in China for thinking about indigenous Chinese traditions and their relevance in the present, in the, in the present uh, day. Sorry, I'll skip over this slide. The other thing that um, he said in the same essay is a society can't be without laws, <coughs> but morality and virtue are even more indispensable. Even in Western countries, legal systems are derived from a Christian system of morality. But presently, China still suffers from a grave problem where environmental laws exist on paper, but they are rarely followed and enforcement of the law is lax. One of the reasons, he says, is that environmental law is not also supported by an environmental moral culture. Right? So we can put all of the laws uh, in place, but if we don't have a cultural framework, if we don't have a moral framework that supports what the law is trying to do, we're putting an enormous burden upon the law, upon the judicial system, upon the police, and a that's a kind of an, intoler an intolerable situation. At the moment in China, of course, we know that Confucian virtues are being uh, espoused and promoted with a view to um, combating the corruption and the perception of a kind of moral laxity 
uh, <coughs> amongst uh, amongst people, uh, amongst especially um, you know, in, uh, amongst uh, the at least the perception of a kind of moral laxity amongst uh, leaders and wealthy people and so forth. And we need and uh, the argument here is that uh, China obliterated its uh, its traditional teachings and there's no framework, there's no moral framework left to give some guidance as to what proper ethical relations are between, between people. And of course, enforcement of the law in China is, does not happen in the same way that the law gets uh, enforced uh, 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 here. And so this makes it all the more important that we have a kind of um, moral discourse that supports uh, these kinds of um, social <coughs> goals. And mostly, this, is, this argument has been prosecuted in terms of anti-corruption and the relevance of Confucian values for, um, for that. Fine, but what Pan Yue is uh, saying is that within the Chinese tradition, we can also make this same argument in terms of using traditional Chinese values to also support the transition to an ecologically sustainable civilization. That these traditional values, and we're not talking about the kind of authoritarian values uh, supposedly of uh, Confucianism, but other kinds of values found within Confucianism or Buddhism or Taoism or other aspects of, of Chinese culture, we need these in order to form the kind of glue, you know, that can support the creation of this, uh, this can support legal frameworks that can, that can underwrite the ordinary people's acceptance of and embrace of these, um, uh, these uh, uh, <coughs> values of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of environment uh, uh, and, uh, and ecology. Right? It's uh, can't simply done by people at the top writing some laws and then magically expecting the, um, the world to, to happen. I think the same, the same is true in, in many kind of social transformations. I mean, when we think about the enormous transformation in the 20th century about the position of women in society, right? I mean, this is in part, of course, underwritten by legal and political changes, um, but it's also a kind of social, cultural uh, transformation such that, um, such that uh, um, patriarchy and sexism become so deeply embedded in people's cultural frameworks that it becomes a kind of unthinkable to act in that kind of way. It's not that it's, we're not uh, sexists because we fear being put in prison, uh, you know, it, but it becomes natural, it becomes embedded in our, it becomes authentic to, our, um, uh, to ourselves. And here's some slides from a Taoist uh, temple where, I mean, it's a bit cheesy, but um, but uh, you know, this is one way this happens in China is a kind of embedding these environmental messages into religious spaces in, in China. And, um, to, and this is a kind of one kind of small scale way of this idea of creating an environmental culture where, where, where um, these kinds of environmental messages are embedded in, yes, embedded into people's um, cultural, religious um, ex uh, experiences. So I was going to say they're, they're taught. British did in Hong Kong. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and then the third thing that uh, Pan Yue says in this article, which I, again, I'm very, this is a kind of Confucian point. The foundation of great undertakings is embodied in countless small matters and detailed preparations, from forest parks to religious rituals, from detailed, uh, from street sculptures to restroom etiquette, from public welfare and mass entertainment to communal hygiene and sanitation, from the teaching of youngsters to college education, from prohibiting spitting on the streets <coughs> to advocating voluntary tree planting, from green labels to green technologies, from respecting history to restoring hi historical relics. Each aspect of social life can serve as a realm for us to promote and carry forward environmental culture. I think this is a kind of a Confucian argument, and uh, one way I, mean, I like to think about this is, um, uh, so we know in, in Confucianism a kind of core value is that of uh, filial piety, respect between uh, in, uh, the, the generations. So how do you teach filial piety, right? I mean, you don't sit down children and lecture them on the Confucian idea of filial piety, right? You, you, it's when the grandparents come, you say, uh, you must pour a cup of tea for your grandfather, right? And, and the child does what it's told and pours a cup of tea for the, grand, for the grandfather. Through this ritual action, eventually what the, what the child learns is we should be respectful towards our, towards our grandparents. The value is created by the ritual process. 
not the other way around, right? It's the, it's the, the, the physical activity of uh, pouring the tea for the grandparent that creates in the cr that creates that educates the child into this into this into this virtue that is to say in the ritual can precede virtue and it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be the other around and so if we think about what does it mean to create an environmental culture it's not simply about having policies and laws though those of course are absolutely essential it's not simply about espousing cultural values and ideals that can support this it's also about instilling this in people's daily embodied physical life and our s and to make the confusion point our social culture is built up out of these interactions that we have with each other and uh, and with the world it's not that it's somehow created magically somewhere and given and given to us it's constantly being created through the patterns of interactions that we have that we have with each other which is why Confucius and the you know Confucian tradition as a whole is absolutely focused on the precise nature of those patterns of interaction those forms of uh, those forms of embodiment those forms of interaction that we have with each other because this is what actually determines the whole uh, social uh, cultural um, uh, cultural world what my students are thinking about is um, how <coughs> can this whole tradition of <laughs> moving meditation in China be used to cultivate ecological sensitivity? That is to say, can we train in people a sensitivity to the natural world and environment through these moving meditations, through these other kinds of somatic practices that there's a long tradition of in Chinese, in Chinese, in Chinese culture? Um, Richard, uh, Richard Schusterman at which university? In Florida, somewhere, right? He has this whole thing, um, um, soma aesthetics, you know, and so he talks about how we train our bodies to move and uh, th what the importance of this is, and he talks about this in terms of how do we have perfect golf swings, you know, it's like we have to train, I'm sorry, I don't play golf, so I don't know how to, I don't know how to do that. Um, um, uh, thank goodness. Uh, <laughs> How do we, uh, right, we can train ourselves to, to judge our engagement with, with, with the world, right? And we do this through these disciplines of, you know, of the body. And, and in, you know, one article that I wrote, it said, uh, great, so can we train ourselves to have a more, um, uh, a deeper engagement with the, with, uh, with, the, with the natural world, a deeper sensitivity to the natural world. Can we train this through aesthetic disciplines of the, uh, uh, of the body <coughs> so that the overall goal is not to improve our golf swing or our tennis uh, serve, but to, but, but to develop this um, ecological sen um, sensitivity. And there's actually been some research done on this in terms of uh, Qi cultivation practices and the relation to the, 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 sense of the perceptions of the nature by people who go undergo uh, kind of various Qi cultivation practices. They've done some kind of studies, um, studies of this have, are starting to, to happen. But I'm most inspired by my Chinese uh, grad student who wants to create a whole program to educate, to educate uh, primary school children in, you know, in her, in, in Guangdong where she, where she comes from, she's uh, she's absolutely you know um, uh, convinced uh, uh, convinced of this, and this, you know this is what she's um, this is what she's trying to do. So uh, blah blah blah. Yes, that's what I just said. I don't need that. So we have this philosophical idea, a paradigm reversal in terms of understanding the relationship between human beings and the natural environment. We have this imaginative idea of understanding the body as a landscape and the landscape of body which can provide new modes of discourse for framing problems of water security, air pollution, food security, right? We can create a new discourse for this. We can have an ethical framework for supporting attempts to create an indigenous and uh, question mark national nationalistic Chinese culture of ecological responsibility and we can have these uh, kind of somatic practices to support the development of a kind of practical, embodied ecological sensitivity. Uh, this, I think, is the potential, the unrealized potential of uh, traditional Chinese culture and in particular uh, Taoism for engaging uh, this, uh, this uh, one of the most uh, serious problems that the world 
uh, has at the moment. I don't think that this is the whole answer at all, but what I'm saying is that this is a kind of resource that is embedded already within the Chinese civilization that can be reoriented and deployed in the service of this, uh, this goal of uh, creating an, an ecological culture.